hello, hello to in-class flipped design, active learning spaces for student-centered learning. So I know about flipped classrooms, but I don't know about doing it in class. I'm all about learning um, a different way to help our kiddos, right? So in-class flip, I'm excited about this one, y'all. Who am I, you may say? Well, I'm Dr. Desiree Alexander. I am the founder CEO of Educator Alexander Consulting. I'm the one that runs these awesome webinars that all of the amazing educators come to do. If you are watching us on the YouTube channel, no, you don't get the certificate, but you do get the knowledge. And then under the video, you will find the, well, in the description under vid the video, you'll find the resource for today. So definitely go grab that link for the resource. If you're here live, you already got it. Now I'll post it again. All right, so what do we have coming up? If you are in the Chicago area, the Schwamberg, I think I'm saying that right area, I'm going to be at IdeaCon, yay! Come and see me at one of my five sessions at IdeaCon. I look forward to meeting you in person. One of my favorite events, so I am looking forward to next week. And then next weekend, we have Teaching Past the Test, Skills and Tips for Passing the Texas Certification Test. So this is one for Texas educators, however, you can come and always learn, you know, it may have something applicable to you, um, but that is what we're going to be talking about next weekend. Then we have a BER session, the last one for this semester, February 28th for ELA Teachers 20 Best Technology Tools. It is a paid event. And then we have AI for Educators March 2nd. Y'all, it's almost every weekend we have one of these. I'm loving it. So AI for Educators, the keys to successful classroom management. Dr. Marlene is coming back. Um, she usually comes and talks about IEPs and SPED topics. She's switching it up on us a little bit and talking about the keys to classroom management. Then we have finishing the year strong ideas to boost student engagement Saturday, April 27th. Then we have ready, set, record, getting started with video production projects in elementary school. So again, it is for elementary school teachers, but anybody can come and learn because you know the one thing that we do as teachers is modify, right? Um, we can take anything and modify it. So definitely come and learn about how do I get started with video production? How do I help my kiddos really engage in, in video production? Now we have about two to three more webinars that I just need to make the flyer for. So I'm not promoting them just yet, but they're coming. So we have about, about two to three more webinars coming at you pretty soon. We always have our self-paced classes that you can go as um, test prep for Google Level 1, Level 2, SLLA test prep if you're living um, a state that takes the SLLA test and you want to become a leader, support time to talk to me about whatever you want to talk to me about. So we always have our self-paced courses. And then you can always tell me what you want to learn or, or what you want to present at this link. So everything I just talked about really quickly is at edalex.net slash events. Everything in one spot. Go register for webinars. Tell me what you want to present. Tell me what you want to learn. And we'll get somebody to possibly talk on that topic. Whew, I know that was a lot. I know that was a lot, but I try to get done pretty quickly because I wanted to get what you came here for because I am ready to learn. So I know you are ready to learn about in-class flip design. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Alexander, for this invitation to talk about one of the topics that I'm most passionate about. Um, so today we're going to be learning um, about what an in-class flip is for any of you who might not know. And um, I'll be sharing different ideas and, and showing you basically what this looks like. So to get started, um, this presentation is going to be, or this webinar is going to be divided in four parts. Initially, I'm going to clarify what um, flip learning is and like what is the difference between when we when we say flip and in class flip, and then I'll go in depth into the two types of in class flips, which are the in situ and station work, and finally, um, I'll provide some tips and some examples about how you can plan your in-class flip. So actually, before we get uh, started, um, I just want to tell you that I'm an educator. I've been an educator for almost, for more than 20 years. Um, I recently published a book about in-class flip with ISTE, International Society of Technology and Education. And um, 
this is something I've been doing for, I would say about 10 years uh, through trial and error. So I will be very attentive to the questions you have. You can write them in, but you can pop them in the chat. And, um, and there will be some spaces where I'll specifically ask you if you have these questions after each of the sections, okay? So I'll be, I'll be attentive as well to the chat on what you're writing there and any comments. If um, there's anything that you, you're doing or, I don't know, maybe a strategy occurs to you that you could share with the rest of the community here in the Zoom, uh, I encourage you to, you know, type in the chat. If you've tried something out, you're like, oh my God, that's wonderful. You know, I've used this tool, et cetera. It's a really nice opportunity for, for us to be a little more interactive in this space. Okay, so let's get started with our first section, which is flip learning versus in-class flip. So I think the first thing um, that we need clarity on is, you know, what is the difference between flipping and the traditional classroom? So here I have a sketch note that kind of shows what it looks like. So if we're, we're looking at the traditional classroom, usually the teacher is, you know, providing direct instruction and uh, tends to focus more on students understanding concepts and comprehending and that's basically when we are taking up that you know the, all that teacher talking time to explain 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 uh, and traditionally students tend to be passive it doesn't mean they always are but this is kind of you know when we think about traditional classrooms students are passive they're, they're taking notes they're listening right they're completing information in their notebooks etc or ipads etc and what happens outside of class is uh, there's a tendency of telling students, okay, so I explained something to you now. So when you when you get home or when you're out of class, you need to do the, that homework uh, where you apply or you analyze or you create something. And many times students don't really know, you know, you're 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 giving them the big task of actually apply and demonstrate that everything I taught you uh, is clear when I'm not there to support you in the process. So that's the traditional classroom. And then when we flip content, um, we're gonna see we can flip in class and we can flip outside of class. Uh, we provide students content that replaces this direct instruction, right? Could be a video, could be a PowerPoint, et cetera. And students can access it autonomously or in class while we support the process. And then the whole the whole group space is going to be active, uh, and teacher's role is more a guide on the side. So we're going to see how this, what this looks like, just focusing particularly on flipping, right? And for those of you who might need uh, to see a definition of flip learning, um, when when people mention the concept of flip learning or when they talk about this approach, we're usually talking about out of class, doing an out of class flip, right? So students are preparing some type of content uh, before the class and then they get to class to, uh, to do activities with the teacher, right? Uh, why is it not called an out of class flip? I mean, the term was flip learning and then in class flip appeared, but Usually when people talk about flipped learning, it's leaving the content out of class, right? And so in class flip is, um, and here I'm quoting uh, my book. Uh, we've defined it with my co-author, Carolina Buitrago, as a set of adaptable in-class configurations. So there are things that you can, there are ways you can configure uh, activities, uh, which are in situ or the station work and students, the spaces where students coexist individually or as a group um, allow flipped learning to take place, you know, within that classroom setting, whether it's digital, whether it's hybrid, whether it's in-person, you can in-class flip in many ways. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples as well. So you might be wondering, you know, what content can we actually flip? And well, my response to you is basically anything. Um, you can, when we talk about direct, you, you're flipping direct instruction, which is what 
comes out of your mouth, right? And when we when we provide direct instructions, sometimes it's explanations, sometimes it's giving instructions, sometimes it's presenting something, we're modeling, we're giving examples, right? So uh, as you can see on the slide, there's so many um, types of content that we can that we can flip, right? Um, and we'll see a couple of examples as well. So to kind of imagine or visualize what flipping an in-class flipping looks like, if I'm flipping, let's say, um, an explanation, right, of a lesson that I'm going to be teaching my students, if I do the flip, which is the out-of-class flip, my students, this lesson might be a book chapter, right? So then I, instead of me explaining in class all this information that's in a book chapter, I'm telling my students, okay, you need to read that book chapter, you need to take some notes, and you need to that you need to have some type of accountability, which could be taking notes, making a mind map. I give them some type of tasks, right? And then when you come to class, we'll see how well you understood that content that I provided to you through a chapter, right? If I do it, if I do an in-class flip, I'm not leaving what we understand as homework, right? The flip content is going to be everything completely uh, in the four walls of my classroom or the four digital walls of my classroom, if it's a virtual classroom. And what I'm doing as a teacher is I'm supporting the process. So my students are maybe looking at, like reading that chapter together or doing it individually. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm monitoring and walking around the classroom or jumping into breakout rooms, let's say, to see how they are uh, understanding that content that I've given them access to. What is the benefit of flipping? Usually when we flip and we curate or we or we choose content, we save a lot of time. If I ask students, okay, look, you're gonna read this chapter. This is a chapter of 10 pages. You might take 20 minutes or 15 minutes or et cetera, reading it. I would probably take an hour or two hours explaining everything that's in the chapter. And this is like a tendency because as teachers, we talk a lot <laughs> and we we provide anecdotes, et cetera. So when I flip, if I'm flipping the explanation in a five minute video, it's five minutes. And I know that I would never take five minutes explaining uh, that type of content, but but I have it in a video and that's the time that you have, right? So we we tend to have a lot more time to cover content when we flip, whether we flip outside or we flip in class. All right, and, and so another important question is, you know, what resources can I actually use to flip this content? So here I'm gonna provide uh, real examples of um, my classes. And if you have any questions, please, uh, go ahead and write them in the chat. If, if, if you're wondering about something like, but could I actually do this or would this apply to my to my subject, et cetera, go ahead and ask. I'm going to provide different examples of different subjects. So I am, um, I've been an, an English teacher I, or I started out as an English teacher. So I have some examples of teaching English, right? Um, but I also teach public speaking, academic writing. I teach courses on flipped learning. I teach courses on didactics. I, I teach pedagogy courses. Um, and recently, last four years, I teach a course on growth mindset. So I'm going to provide very different examples. Uh, but what's important here is with these examples, uh, the invitation is for you to think, you know, how, okay, she's giving an example about, I don't know, flipping or public speaking, but I teach math. You know, how could this apply to my content? No, like, how does it how can you maybe transform these examples to fit your specific context? So, of course, um, the first the first example I, I give here is video, but it's it's basically because when the definition of flipped learning um, first appeared officially in two thousand and fourteen, they the definition mentioned typically videos and flipping started out uh, with two chemistry teachers 
recording themselves so that there's the students who lost class or who couldn't make it or had to do sports and travel, et cetera, could watch the lectures through the videos, right? But the concept of flipped learning has evolved so much that there are, you know, there are many possibilities of resources that doesn't have, they don't have to be a video, right? So one of them is a video. And if, if it applies to your context and students need to see something, it's great, right? But there are so many other options. So um, so here's a video, uh, podcast. Recently, I, I, I taught a course um, with Nomi Sharan. She's from Israel. Um, this was actually last year. Uh, we taught a course about communicating with a growth mindset. And it was a, we did a co-teaching uh, online for a, a online workshop. And so we wanted to flip the explanation of what a growth mindset was and like examples of how to communicate through a growth mindset. And we decided to record a podcast. And so the students who were um, from a company, we were teaching students of a com in a company, they had to listen to the podcast and this was flipped, not in class flip. They listened to the con to the podcast. They had to make um, like a mind map of what they understood. And then when we connected, they had to show us and clarify doubts about the, the concept. So that's just an idea there. And podcasts, you know, people are listening to podcasts more and more every day. You can also create infographics. Um, I'm, I'm providing examples of content that I have created, but you don't have to create anything because there are so many things out there um, that, it, you know, you can find videos created by other experts. You can find podcasts where there are explanations that you're like, oh, I love it. You don't need to do anything from scratch. However, research has uh, demonstrated that students feel more connected and more engaged if the content is actually created by their teachers. And students have also reported that they don't mind if it's not perfect. They don't mind if the video has, you know, if the teacher messes up during the video, if the if the content that, um, you know, ha has some type of error, they, they really appreciate the fact that they are receiving content that has been created for them by their teacher. Um, so that's the plus side, but of course, creating your own content takes, <laughs> takes time. Um, so that's a decision you can make, no? Um, for example, so that's the infographic. This is an infographic for a public speaking course where I teach students um, how to make presentations and the importance in this particular case of choosing a technique to start a presentation. So what I did was I designed um, using Canva, I designed an infographic with the different types of techniques and just giving them ideas of what they could do to uh, to to start their presentations, right? Instead of me presenting one by one the techniques. So I was able to save a lot of time and they had this uh, resource to access whenever they needed to go back to it, right? And that's 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 a key word of flipping. And it's when you flip content, you make your content accessible, right? It doesn't disappear, um, you know, with, with the class being over and like, oh, it just stays in my memory or in my notebook or, right? They can go back to it. Um, you, you can use textbooks. A lot of schools and a lot of um, educational institutions, universities use textbooks to teach a specific subject. In my case, um, I designed a course uh, about in class flip. And of, of course, the textbook is <laughs> the book that I co-authored. So the course is designed for students to read a chapter, right? Like to prepare the chapter. And then when they come to class, we we, we do hands-on activities, right? I don't want the class to be focused on me explaining what is in the chapter of my book? That's well, I wrote it in the book, and you know you can you, you can dedicate that time. But then when you're with me, let's really you know practice uh, so that I can give you feedback and I can support you in the process. Um, another resource that I that I love um, that is not digital is a uh, fan scene, and you're seeing. This picture is of a growth by growth mindset course. Uh, we talk about 
the the marigold effect and it's like a story it's a it's a short story on how educators can be marigolds and help others grow and so instead of reading it aloud or instead of projecting it and you know like me being the one to tell the story i decided to design uh, a fan scene and give it to my students so that they could read it um and then we could talk about it and also that these are different ways that i'm replacing my voice uh, right like my direct instruction using my voice in class um and i have another example which is right here it's in spanish but it's uh, when i give a workshop of about in class flip i talk about the types of stations we'll see that a little later and so i made a fan scene where i explain what each of these stations is so just to give you some ideas there um you can also use games to flip content i mean we can use games to for students to practice and apply uh different concepts and there are so many different types of games uh but here in this example that you see here even though it's a little small but uh, i designed a game to teach about flip learning so the to, to teach about the flip learning pillars and uh, the indicators and so the game is designed in a way that students click let's say on this little green button and they access the information and they have to check it on their own right that's the flip content there but the actual game has questions focused on the indicators so that while they're playing they're learning the indicators instead of me taking an hour to explain one by one the indicators of each of the pillars of flipped learning, right? So you can also use games um, and, and playful learning to support the learning of content. All right. Other ideas, other resources, uh, you can create audio files. I use a lot vocaroo.com, which is uh, a free resource. And super easy to use. Literally, it's what you see here. You go to vocaroo.com and you record, and then it gives you a shareable link. Uh, so I've used this to give instructions, to send to my students uh, instructions to embed in um, an LMS. I've used it to give feedback um, and just, just to avoid having to, or the need to have the student directly in front of me to give them that information. So I, I've used this for flipping and I've used it in in-class flips where my students, you know, they're in front of a computer or we're doing something and they have to listen and then ask me if they have any doubts. Um, nowadays we have a lot of webinars, webinars that, that are recordable well, because they are webinars and not all of them are necessarily uh, accessible, but they are recorded. Uh, if you've given a webinar and there's a section of that webinar that you consider, you know what, I explained this in this webinar, um, I'm going to ask my students to watch from minute five to minute 10. And then, you know, so you can flip in that way as well, right? Um, flashcards, you can create, you can use flashcards. There are so many resources also to create flashcards. In my particular case, I did a workshop on thinking uh, habits and I wanted to present the content in a different way. So I created, uh, I colored or created like the titles of these and I'm kind of showing you here. I know it's a little, oh, it's appearing over there. We go, um, of each of the thinking habits and then I matched them with the definitions. So uh, in, a, in an in-person, a workshop that I gave instead of me explaining the 16 habits. Um, they had to, you know, like use it as flashcards. They asked me if they had any doubt. And then we, we started, you know, applying and thinking how they could teach this um, in their classes. This was a, a workshop for, for teachers. Slides, of course, we create a lot of slides. Sometimes the slides, we use them only to support is something we're explaining, but the slides could be um, self-explanatory. We can create them in a way that when I share them, my students can understand what the content is 
without me explaining it in real time. You no, know, we can use slides and we can record um, with the slides. Like I know PowerPoint and other resources allow you to record and do like uh like a like a what is this called like a voiceover <laughs> or well, um so there there are ways that you can actually just use your slides and provide them to students so that they have the content. Um, you can also use sketch notes. I got into sketch noting in pandemic. I took a drawing class and started. Initially, the, the objective was for me to learn how to draw, but then I started thinking, you know what? I think I could actually create sketch notes to teach content. And so uh, like the example you saw at the beginning when I'm showing you the traditional versus the flipped classroom to explain something like that's a way that we can that we can uh, that we can provide an explanation in a different way and here's an example um, I have this actually on my website I'll share that with you at the end uh, of a sketch note where I explain flip learning right it might disappear a little because yeah because it's white but there are many things that you can many ways that you can uh, teach this content that doesn't have to be through you uh, directly. Comics, um, I have used ready-made comics uh, like this one. It's a poem by Taylor Malley. And in my didactics courses, I have used it with my students. And so instead of me reading the, the poem out loud or using a video, I use a comic. Um, and then we analyze what's going on and what the role of a teacher is, et cetera. So it's it's a different way. You can create your own comics as well. I have created um, a couple of comics. There are online resources like where you can easily uh, choose characters to to create your comics. And you can convert, for example, I don't know, an article into a comic, right? It could be, uh, or you can convert a chapter into a comic where uh, the characters are synthesizing uh, the key concepts uh, of that chapter, just to give you a couple of ideas, right? So these are some ideas and, and, and well, and whatever else occurs to you that you can use um, in your context, in your subject that could replace your direct instruction is, absolutely viable, right? It's not about like, oh, I can only do this in video. I can only do, no. it's, it's evolving in the way that we're teaching nowadays is evolving. You could even, I would, you could even, um, for those of you who are, you, you know, using chat GPT, chat GPT, uh, is an alternative for your direct instruction, right? Because students, you could use chat GPT in class and tell students, you know what, before you ask me, ask, chat GPT. And that's a way that you're replacing your instruction. No? So there, there are new ways and, every, and education is always involving with technology. All right. So before I move on into um, the Institute in Class Flip, I want to ask if uh, anybody has questions, if there are any doubts. I haven't seen any questions in the chat. Um, if we're good to continue, you can also um, I'm not sure if you have the, the option of reactions, but you can also react and just say like, okay, we're good. Or in the chat. Any questions in the chat either. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's, let's continue. If there are no other questions. All right. Awesome. Okay. All right. So, um, so I mentioned there were the in class flip is a set of configurations that you can use within your classroom setting to present the flip content right then and there. Right. And it's divided in two. One is the in situ in class flip and the other one is the station working class flip. So we're going to start with the in situ in class flip and see, you know, how this works. So the in situ, um, in class flip is, well, as the name says, it's you're providing the flip content right there and then. It's in situ. They're they're sitting in it's sitting in, in class with you, and uh, you're telling, okay, you're gonna look at this video, you're gonna listen to the podcast, you're going to uh, read this comic right here with me 
supporting your process, right? I'm not going to read it for you. I'm not going to say it out loud for you. No, you're going to do it. You're going to access the content, but I'm going to be right here so that I could see how you're understanding in, in real time, right? And so something that I, I, I wrote here is that students are receiving immediate support from the teacher. Right. That that's what make that's the beauty of the in class flip. Right. Because if I flip outside of class, you're accessing the content without me. You might have a lot of doubts and then I'll clarify them next class. Right. But if I'm right here with you. Then you can ask me right there. You raise your hand or I'm walking around. I'm like, hey, is everything OK? Hey, I see you, you look a little confused. No. And there's ways that I can follow up on how my students are accessing and understanding the content, right? And the in situ has uh, three types of interactions. Uh, we've called them the solo, the duo, and the group. And basically it's how students are interacting with them, with their classmates and with the content. So if I'm solo, right, it's an individual task. I'm asking all my students to watch the video on their own, uh, to take out their cell phones, to put on their earphones or their earbuds, right? And we're going to dedicate 10 minutes to watching this video and then I'll be monitoring while they're doing it. It's so it's a solo activity, right? Or I could ask them to do it as a duo and work together um, to construct their understanding of the content as they as as they are going through it. Or they could do it as a group activity, right? Okay. I see there is a question in the chat. Tanisha asks, could you have an activity where students have the pictures from the story and then work in groups to tell what is going on, come up with their own theory of what is happening? Um, yes. Now, if the picture of the story... Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm always thinking about these, uh, and thank you, Tanisha, for that question. I'm thinking of these questions always through the, the flipping lens, right? So, if... You usually show them the pictures and you tell them the story, right? And 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 that's like, and you're gonna flip it, and you're and now you're not gonna tell them the story, right? You want them to look at it themselves to be able to work in group and to kind of construct their understanding of the story. Then that would be considered um, a flip task, right? Now, if the story has pictures and has, it depends on the ages, right? If they, if they don't read, then they're reading the, the images, but if it has pictures and it has text and you're not saying it, but they're reading it together, yes, that would be considered an in situ um, task. And of course, you can do that. And for sure, uh, your students would, I imagine they would enjoy it, right? Um, and then you combine like the them understanding the content with uh, some type of activity as coming up with their own theory or Right, something to support, not just understanding the content, but also, but actually constructing something based on that content. So yes, definitely, right? All right, okay. So that's the NC2. And I wanna give you an example of what, it, you know, what it looks like. So let's say I'm taking a traditional, a, a traditional lesson where I explain a lot of, a lot of, um, a, con a concept, and this is an example from my growth mindset course. So this growth mindset course is divided in six activities. So Im imagine I'm doing it through direct instruction. So first, I'm going to explain to my students what a fixed uh, and a growth mindset are, what is the difference between a fixed and a growth mindset. Then I ask them to do some comprehension questions. Um, and then I, you know, these because I'm working with teachers and where educators, I want them to also learn about the characteristics of a growth mindset based on the work from Brock and Hundley. So I explain it to them one by one, right? And I'll tell them, okay, a growth mindset educator is empathetic, a growth mindset, and that means this and that. Then I'll ask them to uh, do a speaking activity based on these characteristics, and I'll provide some questions uh, for them to talk about the characteristics so they can personalize. And then there's another teacher explanation moment where I talk about the growth mindset continuum because I want them to reflect on their mindsets and identify in which situations they have more of a fixed or more of a growth mindset, right? Um, 
And then finally, I'll, I'll tell them, okay, I want you to do a self-evaluation uh, about this activity. So that's the traditional one. If I turn it into an in situ, what I do is that I start, I identify my direct instruction. Like, where do I, where am I explaining? Where am I talking, right? And can I convert this into something else? Can I, can I, can I replace that direct instruction? So here we see how this lesson becomes an in situ. Um, instead of me explaining, I found a video on YouTube that is like five minutes. It's really good, super clear about the fixed and the growth mindset. Here, it's a five minute video. Here, I take like 30 minutes explaining or 20, right? So I start saving time, right? They do the same uh, activity. Then my growth mindset characteristics, I have done this in different ways, but uh, one of them is I give them a, a cheat sheet. Uh, so what I so I design uh, a, a document where the explanation of the, the characteristics are, right? Like the, the, the characteristic and the definition. Or I've done this a little more interactive, a little more hands-on, and I create matching cards. So I'll put the characteristic, like the teacher is empathetic, and then the definition, and they have to work in pairs or in groups to match. And then I we check together, right? But what what students don't notice is that they're learning the content, right? I'm, I could have decided to explain it, but I no, I wanna I want it to be absolutely student centered, which is the purpose. Um, of in-class flipping. You want to center your class on your students. So finding ways that they can access the content um, and interact with it, right? Um, and then the, the, the third explanation about the growth mindset continuum, I uh, initially I used to, exp I, or I've had a couple of moments where I explain it, but I, I, now what I do is I have a worksheet. It's a continue, it, like in, in, they have to fill in the, the in the continuum where they're at and they find the explanations of like what a fixed mindset is. What does it mean for me to have a fixed mindset in terms of criticism? What does it mean for me to have a growth mindset in terms of um, criticism, right? So this is how you go from a regular lesson to an in situ, because you're doing every, you're still doing everything in class. What you're doing is you're just replacing instead of me talking, I'm going to use this resource. And instead of me talking, I'm going to use this one, right? Um, and that's that's like the easiest way to go and the easiest way to start to do an in-class flip. Before I continue, um, because I am going to give you a couple of more examples with growth mindset, I, I just want to clarify the term. When we talk about a growth mindset, it's, it, it's about our beliefs about learning, right? Um, and I teach a course about our beliefs about learning. And when I have a growth mindset is that I believe that my skills, that my abilities, that my personality can change and that I could take actions uh, through effort, through dedication, through perseverance, through the use of strategies for that to, for me, for me to grow, let's say, right? Um, and the fixed is the opposite. I don't believe I can grow. I don't believe... I, I think things are pretty fixed. You are, you're not. Some people are smart, some people are not. And that has a huge effect on how I teach my classes. So just in case uh, any of you are not familiarized with the concept, because I, I give a couple of examples, like um, I think it's important that you can connect to, to how it is that I'm teaching this content, right? Um, all right, I see uh, Gregory is commenting you see a benefit from these methods to overcome a particular situation you're having okay great your school constantly pages over the intercom as if we were not trying to teach okay and your lecture explanation are constantly interrupted they're watching me on video with earbuds i could tell them to disregard it and keep rolling that's true there you go that's true and uh the important thing of, of that um example that you're providing gregory thank you is when we're giving direct instruction and something like this happens, like we get interrupted, you have to repeat yourself, right? Or or, in, or students get uh, distracted, et cetera. If you're using another, if you're using some type of flipped a uh, resource, in this case, if it's um, if it's a video, students can pause, right? In case they needed to pause and then they continue, uh, or they can go back, or if they got super distracted, right? That there's like this possibility of always 
having the access to that content that doesn't happen in real time. I mean, they have access to you, but there's a moment where you're like, you think I'm not going to explain something five times. I'm not going to repeat it, repeat it. We kind of go forward. If they have a video, it's like, you know, you want to see the video 10 times, go ahead. That's what it's there for, right? You don't have to go, um, you don't have to go with my rhythm. You can use your own rhythm and learn at your own pace if you have the content available to you, right? Yeah, okay, okay. exactly, exactly, Gregory. So if you, if you flip it, you don't have to start over. You just tell students, okay, <laughs> let's just, let's just, <laughs> let's just go. You have it there, right? And you don't have to, um, like, it, it can be very tiring for an educator to have to start over to repeat themselves again and again when these things happen. If it's flipped, you're like, okay, I already made it. I already made the video. It's there, right? Or I found a video um, by someone else, but it's there, right? Okay. Thanks for those comments. Okay. All right. So, so I would say initially, if you're thinking of being class flipping, this is the easiest way to go because it's taking your lesson and then just kind of converting um, direct instruction into flip content and then using it, following the same structure. You don't have to re- you know, consider the structure of your classes, et cetera, but you are reconsidering the content, right? How you, how you show it to students or how you give them access, right? And so here, and so in this example, we're seeing it just to, to, to make the connection with the, um, the solo, the duo, and the group is we decided to mention the interactions because when you plan any class, it's really important to have the interactions in mind, right? It's not just, oh, I'm gonna use this content, but it's thinking, okay, if I'm gonna do a video individually uh, or as a solo, right? It's a solo in class flip, then I need my students to have access to the video, okay? Are they gonna, do they all have devices? Um, do they all have their earbuds? Uh, or do, you know, do we go to a computer room? Or do I ask for a computer card? Okay, this depends on different parts of the world. Um, the access to technology is 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 used in different ways, right? But so that's really important. And then re because this is really important because in the end, since now you're going to be a guide, you need to know everything the student needs to have because if it's coming out of your mouth, all they need to have is like their ears. <laughs> like they have to, you know, they have to be, watching you if, if 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 that's the case or listening um and that's and that's it right but here you're like okay they need devices they need this they need that they need access to to a b or c right and so the way that i've taught this lesson is i vary they go solo they go duo they group they go solo again um and i make sure that they have access to everything that i've thought out um the dynamic of how they're going to be able to interact with the content and with their with their classmates. Okay. All right. Okay. So we're going to move on to the station work in class flip. If you have any questions about in situ, this is a good moment to write it in the chat. This or any moment, but just like <laughs> if you want it right now, it could be a really good moment. If not, I'll continue and, and towards the end we'll also have uh, a moment for Q and A. So I don't see any questions in the chat. All right. So let's talk about the station work in class flip. And, and one thing I want to mention is that the concept of in class flip appeared in 2016 um, through a video that explained the in class flip, right? And the explanation of the in class flip was uh, by a lady called Jennifer Gonzalez. And she talked about how we can access flipped content through through stations, right? And this has been, uh, there has been, a, I would say like a discussion among educators, like, yeah, but that's like, that's the same as station work, right? Um, and how we have understood station work is that students do activities through stations, but the stations don't, have flipped content. At least that's how station work has been understood, right? So the in-class flip station work has the ingredient of the flipped content within a station. So 
if you're if you are using stations, but none of the stations have anything flipped, they're just for the students to do activities, you're doing station work. But if one of your stations includes flipped content, then we would say that fits within the concept of an in-class flip, then you're already doing um, an in-class flip, right? And uh, we, we explained that in the book. We, we clarify these concepts because uh, as educators and as academics, you know, sometimes we mix some terms and, and in-class flip is not the same as station work. It, it's, station, it's station work with flipped content. It's not exactly the same. It has that additional ingredient, right? Um, all right. Okay, I see Monica says, in T2 provides a perfect setting to support students with learning challenges. Amazing. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> I'm glad you feel that way. Um, and there's a lot of possibilities. No, I'm just providing a couple of examples. There's so many, so many things we can do. And it's still evolving, no? Like you can come up, you can probably come up with your own uh, types of stations. There's just so many things that we can do. All right. So let's let's start with understanding the types of stations uh, that we can use. Uh, or the, the types of stations that Carolina and I came up with after years of trying out uh, the station working class flip. So you have the flip station, which is where that content goes, right? Uh, what, whatever it is that you decide to use as flipped content, there is a station where students are going to learn. Like th that's the station that replaces you as the explainer of the content or the master of the content. Then we have the practice station where the where uh, or the the where you put the activities that are connected to that flipped content, right? So that students can demonstrate their mastery uh, of that content. Then we have uh, what we've called an independent station. And an independent station is a station that has resources that students can work with that are not necessarily attached to the flipped content. That's why it's called independent, right? So they're not dependent of the flipped content. So let's say you're going to um, you're going to do a station rotation activity where students learn about the verb to be, right? Then they do some fill in the blanks activities about the verb to be, or they do a matching activity, or they play a game, whatever you decide to do in the practice station. But um, I've created many stations and I have more students than stations. So this is about the dynamic uh, of creating the stations and the rotation. So there's so then I'll have an independent station where students can review the previous topic of my class, right? They're learning about the verb to be, but previously they had learned a, about pronouns, right? Like I, he, she, if I'm teaching English, that's it, right? So then here it's a practice. They're like, they're like reviewing or they could do silent reading or they could play a matching, they could play a game, but that's not, that does not depend on the previous one. So then when the other stations free up, the students move from the independent station into the other ones. Um, and uh, in the book, we have uh, different examples of how this works. And I also have examples of um, how you can use this in, in my blog, uh, which I will be sharing uh, at towards the end of this session, right? Then we have a teacher support station um, where the teacher is not explaining. The teacher is literally supporting. If you're doing station work, but you feel that um, it's better for you to be sitting in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a station where students come to you, they have to show you something or you have something physically that you need to have set in place, then you would have a teacher support station and you tell students they're, they're they're rotating and they're working in that configurate in their configuration and the content and then they'll come to you and you support them and whatever it is that they need or they're struggling or et cetera. So you can use it as a station, but you can also just literally walk around, monitor and provide support, right? You don't need to have a teacher support station, but it could be very helpful in certain contexts to design the lesson in this way, right? Mm -hmm. Then we have the assessment station. A, which is assesses the content is specifically focused on evaluating or assessing uh, what students are working on. Then there's a feedback station, which is 
very different to the assessment. No, even though, so the assessment, they, they're doing, they could do a test, a quiz, uh, complete something with a rubric, et cetera. The feedback is when, where students are providing feedback, right? So where you, the teacher are collecting feedback about their learning, which could, it could be an opportunity for them to reflect on, you know, what did you learn? Write one thing that you learned about today's class or make a drawing of something you learned in today's class or record a TikTok video, whatever. <laughs> you can decide to do it in many ways. They can give feedback about the lesson where you can tell them, okay, how did, it, how did, how did I do? <laughs> you know, how did you feel um, doing this station rotation, right? Or it could be a space for them to provide feedback to their peers, yeah? And then we have the peer instruction uh, station, which is based on Eric Masur's um, work on peer instruction, a pr uh, physics professor at the University of Harvard, um, who talks about peer instruction. And it's when students teach each other content uh, based on flipped content that he provides to them. So here you can have a station where you tell students, okay, when you sit here, you sit with your partner and you explain to each other what this content is, right? Uh, so there are, these are these are the stations we've come up with. Uh, I'm absolutely sure there could be others, <laughs> um, but that's where we're at uh, at the moment. So I wanna, I wanna share with you how the, the types of configurations that you can use to do in-class flips, right? Um, and I see that Emily writes in the chat that she does uh, rotation stations, right? Okay, great, and her social studies class is great. All right, so we have four types of configurations. The first one is a uh, sequenced in-class flip station rotation. And basically, as the name says it, it you need to follow a sequence. So students start in station one, move to station two, move, then three, and then four, right? Which means that the stations depend on the previous one. So students start in a flipped station, then they move to activity one, right? Uh, which depends on this content. They can't do activity one if they haven't seen the flip station. They can't do activity two if they haven't completed activity one. They, they can't do activity three if they haven't completed activity two, right? So that's, that's the sequence. Um, and if you were to start in class flipping with stations, I would recommend you to start here because the sequenced in class flip is can be based on your regular lesson plan. Remember, we said in situ, like start in situ before starting with stations, right? But if you have already thought of an in situ in class flip, like all your direct instruction, you said, okay, I'm going to use these resources. Okay, I got the flip content. I think I'm ready to convert this into stations. Then you take that in situ lesson plan. And you literally divide each activity into a station, right? If it is something that is uh, that has to follow sequence, this is this is the way to go, right? So to give you a real life example of a sequenced mm -hmm. lesson, um, this is a lesson of a, uh, a class that I give about flip learning. It's in Spanish. Um, and what you're looking at here are the instructions that I provide within the station. So I uh, design these and I print them and I put them on the walls or I put them on the tables. It depends on physically where I'm at and how I have access to a certain physical resources. Uh, so in the first station, this my students have never learned about uh, flip learning. So the first station, they need to take a flip learning a document that is on that has been printed for them on the desk. And they're gonna watch a video that I made where I explain flipped learning. This video is in English. So I explained, it, so I print how they can uh, configure the subtitles, right? So I'm thinking of differentiation. I'm thinking of uh, different levels of uh, digital literacy that my students have. So I make sure I give them everything they need so that they could see that explanation, right? All right, they've seen the explanation of flipping. Great, now we can do activity number one, which is 
a sketch note. So I give them um, very specific instructions and they have to sketch note specific uh, concepts that come from this video and they do it in groups. And, and so it's very interesting because in the end uh, they have to take a picture, there's a reporter uh, there's an there are like assigned reporters, so they have to take a picture and upload to a Padlet what they're doing, right? So that while I'm in the classroom, I can also monitor the evidence of what they're doing in the stations, right? And that's just one example of how they can do this. And then uh, when they're done, kind of sketch noting and demonstrating their comprehension of the concept of flip learning, then I tell them, okay, we're going to start tomorrow and we're going to a flip instructions. So we're going to do a flipping instructions activity. Uh, if you want to see some examples, go into this QR code and they, they have access to some examples. They do it together. They have a poster. I've taken markers and they design the flipped instructions. I've also done this digitally, right? I'm uh, like in, in, in virtual classrooms, but in a physical one, I'll take the materials. I'll take the poster. I'll take the markers. I'll take everything that I want them to use so they can be super creative and then they take the picture and they upload it. So um, if my students do not understand the concept of flipping, they're not gonna know how to flip instructions, right? So it's first, second, third, following the sequence and it works very well, right? So that's the sequence. The other one is, uh, is uh, called the half and half and the half and half is when you as an educator, um, for some reason, and this happens in, in some contexts, you might have half of your students with one type of level, like, or one type of, uh, like, mastery level, and others with other, with another level, right? So it might be easier for you to work with half the students because of the number of students that you have and put the other half to do flipping instead of you working with the whole class and then doing the flipping activity. So this is, I work with half of my students, I support them, a, I clarify doubts, et cetera, while the other half are working on the flip content and then we switch. And usually I start working with the half of the students that I start working are the ones that are really struggling. Like they need extra support before they can actually do the flipped content because they have some gaps or there's some doubts, et cetera. And these ones can already autonomously work on the content. So then I make decisions and then they switch. And then I work with the other group, right? The ones who already went through the flipped station, I clarify doubts, the other ones are here. Um, and then I could do a whole group activity uh, to make sure we're all on the same page. So that's the half and half. Then we have the mixed and the mixed in class flip. Um, is the type of configuration where more flexibility takes place. Why? Because you design uh, your stations knowing that you have students who do not need to go into the flip stations. So I'm teaching, um, I'll give the example again with verb to be, I'm teaching the verb to be, but I have students who have traveled a, uh, to English speaking countries, right? Uh, or I have students who have a, a, a native English level because their parents are English native speakers, but they live here in Colombia. So these students don't need to see the explanation of the verb to be because they already use it, right? But it's in my syllabus, I need to teach it. So I design a mixed in class flip where I put the content in the flip stations, but I tell my students, um, who don't need to, I give them the choice. Like, if you want, you can go to the station, but if you're ready, go straight into the practice stations, right? And the way that I design um, this in-class flip is with enough time for students to be able to do um, most of the stations. In the book, we explain in, 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 in detail how you can design a mixed in-class flip, but basically, it's important to have more stations than time allows and for you to give students a, a minimum. So you tell them, okay, we've got six, let's say we've got six stations here. There are maybe 
five of my students are not going to go into the flip one because they already have the the they already have this information and they don't need to. And why repeat if you already have that information, right? So from these, I need my I need my students to do minimum two. If they're fast uh, finishers, then they'll probably be able to do the three and they'll be busy and and this will support their learning process. But there's a minimum of two, and I've designed the lesson so that I know that all my students could reach that minimum of two, right? So we're thinking in terms of differentiation, we're thinking in terms of student rhythms, student needs, et cetera. Um, so that that's, this one is wonderful because it, it allows all that flexibility, right? Um, okay, we have a message, let's see. Not sure what it is called in other states, but it is the equal to the I do, we do, you do method, or are you familiarized with that? I've heard of the I do, we do, you do. Um, but the, okay. It's, I wouldn't say it's specifically equal because the I do is, direct instruction, yes? So if I present or I introduce the content, then that's my direct instruction, right? And then I put, and then we all do, and then they do, et cetera. We can, if, okay, we can flip the I do, basically. <laughs> so instead of I do is, okay, I do this through a video and you're gonna watch it. And while you watch it, I make sure that you're on, that everyone's understanding and if they need to pause, they pause and that they can work at their own rhythm. Like you can make other types of decisions, but I wouldn't say it's, it's equal. I would say you could equate that, um, method to a flipping. If you make to a, to a flipped learning approach, if you make the adjustments with what does the, what does I do the, I do part exactly mean for the, for the teacher. Right. Um, so if, if I do it through flipping, wonderful. And you save more time, um, and you open up time for other types of activities, right? Thank you, Tanisha, for that question. Okay, so that that's the mixed, um, and then we have the looped. The looped configuration, I would say, is one of the ones I use the most. Um, yeah, I, I, it's one of the ones I use the most uh, recently. And the loop configuration is a configuration where students can start in any station, right? And they need to close the loop. So if I'm working with, and I could do this in different ways. I'm just here giving you uh, two examples and, and using the images that appear in the book. Um, you can do a loop with stations where all the stations have flipped content. So let's say you need to cover five topics, right? Um, but you don't have enough time or, oh my God, for me to explain five topics, I know the lesson, the class time is not going to be enough. But wait a minute, if you in class flip it, probably you will be able to cover it um, because we're more, we synthesize with the content that replaces the direct instruction. So if I have to explain five different things to my students, but these five things are not dependent of each other, then that would be ideal for the loop, right? If they are, if they depend on each other, then it's a sequenced, right? You can also do a sequenced, a configuration only with flip stations. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> you can combine the stations however you want. The key is that there should be a flip station because if there is not a flip station, you're not doing an in-class flip. You're doing station work, which is lovely, and you know, go for it. But if we're talking about in class flip, like really, uh, you know, taking myself out of the center of the of the of the, of the lesson, then I want to have those flip stations there, right? So I've done it this way. Um, and another way that you can do a looped is having all the practice stations and the and the flip station outside of the loop, or you can uh, combine. Like like there are practice flip, practice flip. The key in the decision-making process of designing a looped configuration is that whatever they're doing in the lessons, they need to be able to do regardless of where they start, right? So 
the decisions you make of what they're going to do in these practice stations is I know all my students are capable of doing this activity, this one, this one, and this one since the moment they sit in that station uh, when we start the the, the, the the rotation process, right? So that's really important. They should not be uh, dependent of each other in terms of the cognitive information that is required, right? So let me show you an example. Okay. This is an example of a looped, a growth mindset loop lesson um, that I designed last semester. And in this loop lesson, I wanted to cover three key topics, which are the ones that are underlined. So one of them was understanding what the mindsets are, right? Uh, the difference between fixed and growth mindsets. The other one was understanding the continuum descriptions, and the other one was um, the definition. So remember, I showed you how, what this looks like in an in situ flip. So here, what I did is I've done it as in situ. I've done it as as a, as a, as a station rotation activity. So the types of activities do not depend on each other, even though the topic is mindset. So my students could talk about characteristics of a growth mindset educator, even if they don't exactly understand the concept of growth mindset because it's like a it's like a it, it's a different explanation right um so if my students start here or they start here or they start here and then they rotate what they do is they start enriching their understanding right um if i started in the growth mindset characteristics a card game activity and then I went to the to the to understanding the difference between growth and fixed. What this does is that it adds to my to my to my understanding, but it doesn't mean I can't do this exercise without this, right? So there are these type of decisions we can make. Um, if I did it as a loop, then I would just make sure they they and uh, sorry. If I did it as a sequence, I would make sure I would probably I would start with this one, right? But it seems to work pretty well, just how it is. Uh, doing it as a station rotation. And then what I really love about working with stations is I don't need to have all the resources to do certain types of activities, right? Uh, what, the, what I mean with this is, for example, in the let's talk about growth mindset characteristics station, students need to have a deck of cards. If I was to do this with my group of 30 students, and I want to do this in groups of three, I would need 10, deck, 10 decks of cards, right? But if I have it in a station or in two stations, I've duplicated the stations, I just need two decks of cards. So there are stations that you could design um, with a resource that you know you probably wouldn't be able to have for all your students if you were doing it in situ, yeah? Um, I have a I have a colleague in Seattle who teaches Spanish, and she uh, and we 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 give an example of of what she did with her in class flip in the book. But she did a station with virtual reality. So, like, how do you if you only have one, you know, a set of uh, of VR glasses, just one? How are you going to use VR glasses with all your students? Oh, wait a minute. But if I'm working in stations, students get to use it when they get to that station. So I don't need to have, you know, 100 VR glasses or whatever to be able to actually use different types of technology. So this is something really uh, powerful about the station rotation in terms of the logistics of the resources that I need, right? So there you go. That's that's the example. These are the instructions that I use uh, with my students. And this workshop was, was in English, so you see it, you see it in English. All right. Okay, so uh, we're gonna move on to uh, the planning. I've mentioned already some ideas, I've given you different ideas. I've mentioned uh, already some tips, but I'll, I'll go back to some of them here. Do we have any questions regarding the configurations? You will have access um, to in the handout, uh, you'll have access to two videos where you can see these configurations. Um, and of course, you can always go back. I know it's a lot of information, <laughs> but you can always check 
my blog post, you can always kind of go back to some, some of these resources that are that are available online so that you can double check. And well, this recording, of course, and then uh, Dr. Alexander uh, puts it in YouTube and then you can pause it, right? And, and take maybe uh, slower notes or whatever you need. All right. Um, okay, Gregory asks, how do you handle students who waste time at stations and then say they did not have time to finish? This is a really good question, Gregory. Thank you for that. I, the thing with students wasting time at stations um, is that if they were wasting time at stations, you would be able to catch them right away, right? Because, because you're rotating. I mean, they're rotating, but you're also, you're walking around and you're seeing what they're doing. So you can call them out. So you can, right? Like you can give them that feedback right away and support them um, in that process or, you know, whatever strategy helps you when you see students are wasting time. Like, hey, can I, can I have a moment to talk? Can we, can we talk outside for a moment? Or, right? Um, I haven't, I've, I've done in class flips with, um school students like I've done with elementary I've done with um a middle school and high school students when I was a when I was a school teacher I've done this in higher ed I've done this in companies and what I can tell you is one of the things that really surprised me and the reason why I got into I got so into in class flip was that I had students I had seventh grade students who didn't want to do anything at any time, they didn't want to do the homework. They didn't want to, because I was flipping, just flipping. They didn't want to do anything. And when I started doing the station, uh, the station work, and I started trying this out, um, I noticed they were extremely focused. It's incredible. It's it's like if the if there was a switch in their in their attention. It's 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 something. It's very surprising. I was so surprised um, that I started taking note of what I was doing and well, eventually the result is, is in a book, let's say, but so, I mean, Gregory, what I can tell you is if you've designed stations that are active, that are connected to, um, you know, that are meaningful, that makes sense to students, um, that are creative, that make them move, et cetera, it, they tend to focus more than if they're sitting right in a two hour lesson, just taking notes. Like, Cause here they're, they're, they're moving, they're physically moving from, if, if they're in a physical classroom, yeah, they're moving from one, from one station to another, they're doing different things. You're varying, you're taking, you can ask them to draw. You can, you can do many things. That's the beauty of flipping because sometimes we don't have enough time to even think of how can we be creative or how can we do other types of things. Um, but I haven't had students who at the end of the lesson wasted the time at the stations because I can catch them right away and, and tell them, right? Like you would notice something that doesn't happen when you're in the front of the classroom, right? You're, you're, you're like right there by the board. Students are in the back and supposedly they're working, but I'm over here because I'm like explaining something and they're supposed to be uh, doing something. It's hard for me to keep an eye on all these students. When um when I still need to be giving that direct instruction, right? Um, so yeah, I I handle it right there and then. If they're not doing it, it's like, hey, what's going on? Right. Um, and well, of course, we have students who don't ever want to do anything. And that's like, I think that's another story. Yeah. All right. I see. Um, thank you, Gregory, for that question. Uh, Monica, you your comment is, I see in situ learning providing a framework to plan, account for student learning and making it feasible for educators to assess and monitor students as they are working and use this information to further their learning and or address needs. Yep, absolutely. And I mean, student accountability is, is, is crucial in how I plan, or it's, it's crucial how I plan the activities and the flipped content for accountability to take place, right? And for students to develop their autonomy and to learn to be autonomous and not depend on the on the teacher uh, in asking, you know, teacher, what does this mean? Um, 
you know what does this mean did you did you go through the flip station oh no i okay you need to go there <laughs> or yes i did okay you, you can go back it's right there the content is accessible to you double check it and then let me know right but we don't have to repeat ourselves over and over again in in this process all right so some tips for planning um your ink class flips so the first thing um is to take a lesson you already teach i would i mean if you want to start from scratch you want to like i want to do a completely different lesson it's going to take a different type of thinking process but if you have a lesson right like think of a lesson that you've already taught so that it becomes easier for you to kind of make the switch right so take any uh any lesson that you plan to teach that you have it uh in in the way that you tend to teach it if you're not flipping right um and then identify where you give that teacher explanation like where is it that i'm actually you know standing explaining a well, standing sitting in front of the you know in front of the in front of the screen if i'm teaching uh, virtually or in front of my students if i'm teaching in person or both if i'm teaching hybrid right like what is that direct instruction that i that i'm giving so of course it could be remember explanations examples demonstrations modeling uh, etc so where is that identify it and really important a really good um tip is to focus on where you repeat yourself the most, right? So the example of, oh, we get interrupted, I have to repeat myself, repeat myself. Oh, maybe I can do a video. There you go. You're already thinking, how can I, how can I can how can I make this instruction more efficient and more accessible for my students, right? So that's the first thing. Like where do you repeat yourself? Um, for example, if you're thinking of instructions, when I give instructions, are there instructions that students are like, teacher? Can you repeat, teacher, sorry, when, where, what, how long? If you're noticing this is happening, that's where you want to start, right? Um, so that's in terms of the, the, the direct instruction. So you've identified in that lesson what the direct instruction is. Choose a resource. What is? What do you want to use to flip, right? Do you want to make a video? Do you want, sorry, do you want to create or do you want to curate? You don't remember, you don't have to create. Creating takes time. There's a beauty in creating. There's a, a, a huge value in creating towards the future because the time that you spend now creating content in the future, you're going to thank yourself. <laughs> you're going to thank your past self and you're going to say, oh, I am so grateful that I created this and that I could still use it for the lessons that I tend to teach the same things, right? When the concepts don't change, et cetera, you made a video, the concept is the same. You're going to be able to use that video, if, you know, for, for some time uh, until you want to vamp it, revamp it or whatever. Um, so choose that resource. It, but important is that whatever resource you choose, think if it will allow you to offer the same quality as your own explanation, right? That's why the video was kind of where this started. Because if I give you an explanation in real time, but then I just record myself with the same explanation, well, I'm giving you the same quality. I mean, it's me explaining, just I'm not explaining in real time, right? But if that's, so it, that, that's important, the quality. Like, will this resource replace me? If I look for a video in YouTube, if I find uh, somebody's, sketch notes about a topic that I'm teaching, you know, is it good enough? Wonderful, right? Because we want to re we want the replacement or that flip content to be as good as we are. If we create it, it's going to be as good as you are because you are the one that's creating it. But if we don't create it, very important to make sure that it's the quality that you expect, right? Then choose how do you want to flip? You want to flip out of class or you want to flip in class? If you want to flip out of class, then okay, then you assign. You've got that, you've got that flip content, assign it out of class, provide some very clear instructions to students, and then okay, I'll see you in class and we'll clarify doubts, etc. 
but you want to do in class, right? Which is the focus of this session today, then that's where, right? I want to do it in class. Okay, what makes more sense to me? Do I want to do in situ or do I want to do it straight with, or do, or do I want to do this with stations, right? And between both of them, as I mentioned, in situ is the easier uh, way to start, right? And stations requires another level of uh, logistics in terms of the instructions, in terms of, because if I create stations, I have to have clear instructions. I mean, my students need to be able to know what they have to do without me, right? So the instructions have to be crystal clear. Um, the accountability, the task that they're going to do, the timing. You no, know, there's many uh, like aspects to consider. If I do an in situ, I'm the one guiding the moments, right? I'm saying, okay, first we're going to watch this video. And then I monitor and I make decisions in real time, but I'm working with the whole group, right? I'm the one kind of like really guiding that process. With stations, I'm more in the background because they're moving on their own and doing the work, right? Okay. And uh, I think one of my biggest pieces of advice is to take it one step at a time. Yes. Don't don't go crazy wanting to flip everything. <laughs> If you have not flipped before, um, or maybe you weren't conscious that you had flipped, because I'm sure we've all, you know, flipped at times, it starts small. And one thing I recommend that teachers do to start small is by starting with instructions, like not even an explanation. No, start with instructions, the instructions of an activity. And for this, I have a blog post. Um, I created a blog post with the step-by-step -step of how you can flip instructions, how you can design them, what are the elements that you can include into uh, your instructions so that students, so that you can differentiate you know, how you're giving these instructions, et cetera. Um, and that is definitely the, 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 the easiest thing you can do. <laughs> flip instructions and then use it in situ, right? And then you can go, little by little constructing your understanding um, of flipping your direct instruction. All right, so I'm gonna, now we can start uh, our Q&A session. Comments you might have about um, the explanations. And here we can, you can write in the chat or if you want to uh, if you want to talk, if you want to open up your mic, that's also a possibility. Any questions that are if you want to unmute yourself, you can go ahead. So while we think about and maybe questions we have. I would like to ask you and to write in the chat, which of the two configurations uh, do you feel more inclined towards trying out, the in situ or the stations? We'll take a moment and write in the chat if you had to choose one. <laughs> if you like both and you want to go for both, wonderful. Um, okay, Monica says in situ, all right. In situ, okay. Diana says stations. Okay, Monica, you teach grade one, right? So maybe, yeah, guiding guiding that process a little more. Although um, we, uh, I've seen in class flips, uh, station in class flips in, in grade, in first grade as well. So it's doable. It's, it's, it's a lot about how you provide the instructions to first graders if, for example, they don't read, right? So, you know, can I create stations where I appear as in a video or or where the instructions are recorded and they, they have to listen to them or where the instructions, <clears throat> sorry, um, are given through uh, like flashcards. There's, there's 
there are different types of resources that could be adapted to to young learners. They're very young learners. Um, but of course, because they don't have that autonomy, uh, they require a different type of logistics. But um, I have seen in class flips with first graders and and they are doable. Yes. All right. I see a lot of in situ um, stations, right? Lindy says stations. Shirley says both. Great. Emily's going to keep doing stations. Wonderful. All right. Tameka says both. Tameka or Tamika, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Tisha stations and open to trying in situ. Okay, wonderful. All right, so we have, yeah, different, uh, the different possibilities. Recommendation for those of you at stations. Um, station, the thing with stations is you can't do stations all the time. You can try to do stations all the time, right? But students get tired of station work. Um, and so, you know, stations, it's like to work them occasionally, right? You don't want to, you don't want to plan station work every class or every other class or uh, because, well, one, students get tired. Two, station work requires more, more planning and more, um, like creation, like instructions and these type of things than the in situ does, right? So just, you know, that's important to, to really keep in mind. Um, but for those of you who have never tried stations, um, they are game changers. If you've never done like flipped stations with flipped content, they are game changers. Students love them. Um, and again, they, they allow us to do so many creative things because it's, you know, you don't have to have all the materials you want students to do. I've done stations with Play-Doh, right? So I don't have to have Play-Doh for all my students. I just have to have Play-Doh for the station. <laughs> Enough for when they get there, they could do the tap, right? Right. Um, okay, Monica says, teach in public system and sometimes care, parent caregiver support is not available, right? I think, so... The, the with that comment that you make, Monica, about like not having parent or caregiver support um, is the reason why I do not recommend flipping out of class with young learners. Because if we if expect young learners to access flipped content, right, as homework, let's say, they we need that parent caregiver support. We need to have, you know, uh, those who can help us get the young learner to open the resource or et cetera. If we don't have that caregiver support, then definitely in-class flip will be the way to go, right? Because you are the one who supports and you are the one who has control over all the resources in the classroom with your students. Yeah, so that's that's something um, really important to, to keep in mind, okay? All right, do we have any questions, any comments? Would anybody like to open their mic and and, Tell us a little bit what you're thinking. Um, in the meantime, here, are, uh, this is my social media, my website. If you want to follow my blog posts, if you want to uh, subscribe to the newsletter, I I post about flipping and resources and technology and growth mindset and <laughs> different things. Any questions? Was I that clear? I'm, I'm very surprised. <laughs> Any for more questions. And if you're interested in the book, um, you can find it at isc.org. You can find it on Amazon or different uh, book uh, platforms. Um, it's, it's available digital. It's available physical. For those of you who are in Colombia, South America, um, there's free shipping to Colombia. So I know we're here from different parts of the world. So they're available in different in different platforms as well. I would love to know uh, what you do uh, with this content, right? Like if you start in-class flipping, if you're on Twitter, if you're on Instagram, 
um, or well, sorry, if you're on X or you're on Instagram, you're on LinkedIn. Um, I would really love, I love seeing how educators try out the resources, you know, the stations, the configurations, the in situ, what they come up with. Uh, because all of this also supports my own understanding of how in different parts of the country, in different parts of the world, uh, we can do this, right? And how we can rethink and continue to evolve our understanding of flipping um, for different types of learners. Okay. Well, I will say I completely agree with Gregory that there's no questions because you were so thorough. Um, oh, throughout wow. the talk. So I completely agree with him um, that probably when they go and start trying it, it probably will be some questions that come. But um, man, this was such an excellent presentation. Like the, the definitions, the theory, and then going into the practical examples, what to do, what not to do. Just it was such a, like Gregory said, I hate to steal his word again, but such a thorough presentation. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for connecting on a Saturday <laughs> from the different parts of the world where you're at. Um, please do keep in touch. Um, and again, if you want to follow the, you know, the things that I, that I, I, I love, I'm all about open source and sharing and, uh, so you can subscribe to my newsletter through my website. You can follow me on Twitter, on X, uh, LinkedIn, etc. And uh, if there's anything you saw that you like, you know, you said, hey, you know, I, I saw this game or I saw, you know, this what you're doing with the fan scene. Uh, I also wrote a, a blog post about how you can uh, create fan scenes. And there's uh, and I have a blog post about sketch notes. So. There's there's a lot that I try to share to to share and to post. Some things I sometimes don't have enough time to post, but I'm very open to sharing. Um, if there's anything you would like to have access to that I showed here, like you know the actual resource, I'll be more than happy to share with you. So thank you again, thank you, Dr. Alexander, for this wonderful space of learning and sharing with other educators. I really appreciate the invitation.